Today I'm going to talk about the attractive Casimir force between electrons. And it may have never occurred to you that there's an attractive force between electrons. But imagine lightning. In lightning, a potential builds up in a cloud or the ground. And all of a sudden this arc forms. And then there's a loud bang as the air comes back together where it was evacuated. Well, that arc looks like a line to our eye, but it's a cluster of electrons. Hundreds of thousands or millions of electrons are required to form an arc. But because of Coulomb repulsion, negative charges being repelled from negative charges, based on standard physics, those electrons should just scatter. They should just dissipate in the air. They shouldn't stay together in a ball while they're forming an arc. So there must be some type of force that causes electrons to temporarily cluster together to form arcs, like we see in lightning. And something like ball lightning couldn't occur unless there's some sort of force that holds the electrons together in space, some interaction. Well, that force is a Casimir effect. And to begin with, we have to understand how the electron has structure. And the structure comes about because electrons polarize the quantum field. They're constantly polarizing the quantum field so that the electron causes quantum fluctuations like electron-positron pairs to polarize. So you have a negative charge here, you get a positive charge and a negative charge, and they orient themselves. But what happens is, as all these charges orient themselves, they can't move in opposite direction because that causes light charges together. So they tend to rotate. They tend to all rotate the same way. And because they're rotating, they're eventually limited by the speed of light as to how fast they can rotate. The tip speed is limited. And you can consider what we call the rotating spherical shell model. In the early days of physics, when they were modeling the magnetic moment of the electron, they said, well, what if we have a rotating spherical shell? And they realized it would have to rotate well, twice the speed of light, actually, to get the right number because of the g-factor. And, but that's the model they used. Well, if you have dipoles, you end up with two spherical shells rotating in opposite directions, which doubles the amount of magnetic moment. When you calculate the magnetic moment mu, you have the speed of light c, the electric charge e, and then lambda e, which is a Compton wavelength. The Compton wavelength tells you the dimensions. Whenever you're calculating magnetic moment, you need three things. You need the charge, you need the radius, and you need the velocity. You need to know the angular velocity. And so it's divided by four pi, which gives you the angular velocity. So that all makes sense if we're talking about a shell forming around the electron the size of the Compton wavelength. And in a physics textbook, they usually put the magnetic moment formula in terms of electron mass because they're hiding the fact that they're using the Compton wavelength as the physical dimension of the electron, whether intentionally or not. That's what they're doing. They're disguising the fact that they're using it. And we can understand that with scattering experiments, in some aspects scattering experiments, we may scatter off this Compton wavelength structure in Compton scattering, for example. But in other scattering experiments, the particles may go through it, and we can try to scatter off whatever the central polarizer is. And it's the central polarizer that is really tiny potentially less than 10 to the minus 18 meters, or much more, much smaller. So we can have this quantum field structure 
and not have it show up in certain experiments and show up in other experiments, which is exactly what occurs. Now next, we can confirm that we have the spherical structural shell, the Compton wavelength, because that is where mass comes from. If you realize that this type of electron will be filled with quantum fluctuations in the inside, and it will have quantum fluctuations on the outside that are bigger than it. But it won't have quantum fluctuations that are that match the size of the shell. They'll be excluded. Well, if you calculate the amount of quantum field energy, the amount of zero point energy excluded by the shell, that's the mass of the electron. That's where the mass of the electron comes from. And the mass of the proton is the same way if you use the charge radius. In fact, the proton is the same way if you use the charge radius in terms of structure. So, this confirms that not only does this Compton size structure give us the magnetic moment and the spin and angular momentum, it also gives us the mass of the electron, which really confirms that we have a real physical structure here. Well, since we have a real physical structure here, and it's known to scatter quantum fluctuations, light, other electrons, due to Compton radius type scattering, it's going to cause the Casimir effect to exist between two spheres. That as these two spheres get closer together, they'll be pushed together by the Casimir effect. And we can use the force proximity approximation um, or proximity force approximation to measure this. It's one of the simplest ways to measure the Casimir effect, where you just treat it like the walls of two shells. And the approximation works by treating it as a series of parallel plates. So you use the parallel plate equation and then modify it for the curvature. And this is a simple technique that is typical throughout calculus to, to look at things piecewise, fashion like that. So by using this equation, and I'll put it up, you can calculate the Casimir force between two spheres. And when you do that for an electron, you find out that between about one and six nanometers, you have an attractive force between the electron that the, this attractive force overcomes the Coulomb repulsion and allows the electrons to be briefly close together. So you're talking about maybe four times, four times to just under five times the radius of the electron, the Compton wavelength, down to maybe one times the Compton wavelength. At, at the closest approach. So they have this really close range where electrons can cluster together. Now they can't form stable atoms because there isn't a neutral particle to help bind them. There's no neutron that is electron size. The neutron has a smaller size. And why that is is a topic for another video. But um, because you don't have a neutral atom, and these electrons are constantly jumping around in quantum jumps and interactions, they eventually jump apart. So these clusters can't last forever. They can last when you have a high potential that is causing them to cluster together. But once that potential dissipates, they're going to dissipate. So, we have this force, and this force at its maximum, at about one uh, picometer, one times 10 to the minus 12 meters, and the Compton radius is 2.426 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So at the closest approach, this force is about 50 times the Coulomb force, which is similar to the strong force, which is about 100 times the Coulomb force. And if you actually measure this between two protons, based on there being spheres the size of the proton charge radius, you also get a Casimir attraction between protons that's equal to the strong force. 
So when people say that that leptons, by definition, and electrons in particular don't participate in a strong force, they're wrong. Electrons do participate in a strong force, but only with each other. Because of the vast size difference, with protons being a thousand times smaller than electrons, there isn't a Casimir effect between electrons and protons. There's a Casimir effect between protons and protons, and a Casimir effect between electrons and electrons, but not between protons and electrons. And what happens at the closest approach distance? Why, why isn't the Casimir effect so strong it just causes electrons to stick together? Well, that comes back to a repulsive force that develops between electrons, which is part of what is called electron degeneracy pressure. And that when two electrons come together, they feel solid. They can't get closer than a certain point. So my electrons and my two fingers meet, and eventually it feels solid because the electrons are repelling each other. And that's what makes things feel solid. And that's what causes this eventual repulsion between the electrons. And so that's how we get lightning to exist. As I said, without some sort of force like this, lightning couldn't exist. And lamps, couldn't, arc lamps couldn't exist. We wouldn't have many of the arcing devices or neon lights. They would have the charge dissipating rather than the charge being able to run in a line through an arc. Like when you touch, touch a finger to a doorknob when you have electric charge built up and you get an arc. That requires us with this force. And so I hope you've learned something today, learned about a new force that perhaps you didn't know about before or one that you thought about and not realized how it happened. But the Casimir effect is how it happens. That's how electrons stick together and cluster together. So if you like the video, please like, share it with your physicist friends, and subscribe if you want to see more. And then I have books on quantum field theory and also my particle theory book. In the particle theory book, I describe the electron structure in more detail, along with proton structure and, and only in theory model that describes all the other resonances. And I'm a retired independent researcher and buying a book helps support me in my retirement and helps me do more research and more videos. And so I appreciate it if you buy one of my books to help me out. And I also have a Patreon account if you want to support my research that way. So thanks for watching.